Good morning, everybody. It's great to be worshiping with you on this beautiful morning, both those of you who are here in the sanctuary, but also those of you worshiping at home. I'm going to start with a, a brief reading from Psalm 119, a, a short passage from a very long psalm. Um, and, and so starting in verse, um, in verse 81 of, of Psalm 119. My soul faints with longing for your salvation, but I have put my hope in your word. My eyes fail looking for your promise. I say, when will you comfort me? Though I am like a wineskin in the smoke, I do not forget your decrees. How long must your servant wait? When will you punish my persecutors? The arrogant dig pitfalls for me, contrary to your law. All your commands are trustworthy. Help me, for men persecute me without cause. They almost wiped me from the earth. But I have not forsaken your precepts. Preserve my life according to your love, and I will obey the statutes of your mouth. We're going to be talking a little bit later about something that I I think all of us go through at some point, and that's kind of struggling with with questions, with doubt, with with wondering, with uncertainty about who we are and and, and what God has called us to do and what God has called us to be. And, And... the psalmist was no stranger to that. We, we find examples of it throughout scripture. And in, and in the psalmist, this, this notion of, of fainting with longing for God's salvation, wondering as, as, as he looks at the world around him and maybe as he looks at his own life, you know, is, is, is God present here? Where, where is God in this? But then ultimately calling upon God and saying, God, show me your love, show me your goodness, and I'll, I'll turn to you. And that's, that's the hope that we have, and that's, the, that's the, the promise we have throughout Scripture, is that God is there, and when we turn to him, he'll, he'll make himself known. And, and we're going to be talking about that a little bit later today, but also it's something we affirm every time we come together for worship. Um, we, we, don't, uh, we don't hide from the fact that when we come into this place, there, we, we, we're wrestling with things. We have burdens, we have struggles, we have questions. Um, and God doesn't run from that. God doesn't, uh, God doesn't get angry at us for that. God is, God is present, and God wants to hear from us, whatever, whatever it is we're wrestling with. God wants to, to hear us call on his name in prayer and in song, and when we gather at his table, when we gather at his word. Um, and, and so that's the God we worship. We worship a God who, who knows our struggles, a God who knows our, our, our challenges that we face, who knows the burdens we carry, and yet walks with us through those things and makes himself known through those things. So as we, as we come together today, let's sing, let's pray, let's, let's worship that God together. Let's join him as we, as we lift up his name.
darkness keep me light in the darkness my god that is who you are you are here touching Scripture this morning comes out of Romans chapter 8. There we go. Uh, Romans chapter 8, verses 18 through 30. I consider that our present sufferings are not worth comparing with the glory that will be revealed in us. For the creation waits in eager expectation for the children of God to be revealed. For the creation was subjected to frustration, not by its own choice, but by the will of the one who subjected it in hope that the creation itself will be liberated from its bondage to decay and brought into the freedom and glory of the children of God. We know that the whole creation has been groaning, as in the pains of childbirth right up to the present time. Not only so, but we ourselves, who have the first fruits of the Spirit, groan inwardly as we wait eagerly for our adoption to sonship, the redemption of our bodies. For in this hope we were saved. But the hope the hope that is seen is no hope at all, Who hopes for what they already have? But if we hope for what we do not yet have, we wait for it patiently. In the same way, the Spirit helps us in our weakness. We do not know what we ought to pray for, but the Spirit itself intercedes for us through wordless groans. And he who searches our hearts knows the mind of the Spirit, because the Spirit intercedes for God's people in accordance with the will of God. And we know that in all things God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. For those God foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son, 
that he might be the firstborn among many brothers and sisters. And those he predestined, he also called. Those he called, he also justified. Those he justified, he also glorified. You may be seated.
Will you please pray with me? God, we just thank you for your goodness and your mercy and things that we might put into a cute song, but there's so much deeper meaning when we think of all the ways that you are truly good to us. We thank you for that, the deep goodness that you gave to us when you sent your son. We thank you that you haven't just wiped us out despite all of our bad things that we might do and despite all the good things that we think look so good, but you said that they're not really that good. We thank you also for so many small things and, small and big things that we have in our lives. We thank you for all the ways that you work through our lives. Lord, we also come to you confessing our sins. We pause just to think of various things that we may have said, things we may have done, things that maybe we didn't realize we did, things that maybe we knew we should have done, but we did them anyway, things that maybe we should have done, but we didn't do them. Lord, we also come to you thankful for so many things in our lives, for people that you put into our lives. With tomorrow being Memorial Day, we really want to thank all those who actually gave their lives for us. We have a list of them in our bulletin, but we know that there are so many more people in our lives, outside of our lives, that we're willing to do things that maybe most people wouldn't want to do, and they protected us and gave us freedom. Lord, we also lift up the student fellowship at the campus house at UTSU. We ask that you be with the leaders there, those that have led throughout the year, and that maybe taking a break for the summer, but we know that your, your work is never truly done. And we wa ask you to watch over them as they prepare for another year. We also lift up the International Conference on Missions, which happens in November, but those that are on the mission field don't ever just have one day where they come and put together a show for you. They work tirelessly throughout the year and those that support them do as well. We also thank you for all the people here at our small church. We thank you for the love of those that are working in the background, that work in the foreground, that do things that maybe others don't know about. We thank you for those that come and those that listen. We ask you to be with our ministers, and we ask you to be with all the people that um, are in the larger church, not just here in Irwin or in the United States, but all throughout the world. Please guide those to really listen to what you might have to say and to be willing to take the step they might need to, step, might, might, might need to take. We also lift up our um, mission of the month Camp ACC is going to start soon, and God, you know how much work people put in to prepare for the summer, those that work at camp, those that come in just for the maybe a week, but they put in so much more than a week's worth of effort, and those that send money to them, and those that work just by volunteering, maybe losing some sleep and helping people that might not always want to be helped. We just thank you for those that are willing to volunteer and work in that way. And finally, Lord, we just wanna lift up those that are struggling with all kinds of hurts, health issues, and spiritual, spiritual warfare. You see so many things that we don't see. 
and we ask you to open our eyes to what we should know about. And we ask you to just put a hedge around each of us and our families and our church as a whole. And we thank you for your love. It's in your name I pray. Amen. I'm not usually taken with whatever's trending these days, all those posts on social media that go viral. In fact, I'm usually not aware of them. Sometimes, though, the algorithms that control, honestly, more of my life than they should, they find something they think I want to see, and they show it to me. And what's scary is they're usually right. Such was the case a few weeks ago when a clip from a sermon by Alistair Begg appeared in my Facebook news feed. Alistair Begg is a Scottish Presbyterian minister who has many ministries, among them a popular radio program. Owing in part to his thick Scottish accent, things he says sometimes go viral. In this sermon, he was commenting on the importance of preaching on the cross and preaching it often. That if we neglect to do so, we easily slip into an arrogance that is tantamount to idolatry. He asked his listeners to consider their arrival into heaven and their answer to the question, how is it that you're here? If our response is in the first person, he says, we've immediately gone wrong. Because I, because of what I've done, because I am baptized, because I go to church, because I'm a Christian, even because I believe. No, he says, the answer must be in the third person. Because he, because of him, because of who he is, because of what he has done. Consider the thief on the cross, Peg says. Imagine an angel greeting him in paradise and asking him that very question, why are you here? I don't know. You don't know? What do you mean you don't know? I'm sorry, I don't know. Hold on, let me, let me get a supervisor. The angel brings a supervisor out. Sir, I'm told you, 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 you don't know why you're here. Tell me, are, are you familiar with the doctrine of justification by faith? Never heard of it. Have you ever read God's word? Have you ever been baptized? Are you a member of a church? No. Never. The supervisor's getting frustrated. Well, then on what basis are you here? And the thief says, because the man on the middle cross said I could come. The man on the middle cross said I could come. That isn't just the thief's answer. That's the only answer. And pray that is our answer too. The only way any of us will ever be invited in is by the invitation of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. So it is at this table. It is his body that is the bread. It is his blood in the cup. He prepared the meal. He showed us how to partake of it. He invited us to take a seat. We would not be here. We could not be here without first our Lord inviting us to be here. As with all good things, our baptism, our good works, our church life, even our faith, we could never hope for such gifts without their generous giver. In John 15, 5, Jesus says, apart from me, you can do nothing. That includes this meal. Such is the substance of our remembrance, the understanding that without our Lord, we would not have his meal. We would not have his invitation. We would not even have the faith to accept it, to receive it. The faith to accept him, to receive him. As we come to the table again this morning, remember that it is only by our Lord's grace that we are here, that we are together, 
that we hunger for him, that we thirst for him, and that only by him are we filled. Our table is open to all believers, but don't believe that it's an open invitation, a single invitation for billions. No, it's an individual invitation. Not one for all, but one for each. Our Lord is looking directly at you, his chosen one, and saying with all his power and grace and mercy and love, you can come.
Please pray with me. God, we thank you for your goodness. We thank you for your greatness. We thank you for your, your love and your grace and your mercy that while we were far from you, while we were even, as Paul says, your enemies, you saw fit to, to love us. You saw fit to, to send your son into this world that he might live among us, that he might teach us, that he might point the way to, to you and your kingdom, and then that he might die for us. And so, God, we, we come to this table knowing that, as, as Ben reminded us, it's, it's all because of your goodness that we're here. It's all because of your grace that we're here. Uh, Lord, we, we come as invited guests to a, to a table, to a, to a banquet that, that we know we, we don't deserve, and yet we receive the gift of your mercy. We receive the gift of life that you hold out. So God, as, as we take this bread, as we take this cup, we pray that you would give us hearts that are full of thanksgiving. Give us hearts that are mindful of how we've sinned against you, but most of all that, that you give us hearts that are mindful of your great love for us. Let us receive this with joy and with gratitude and with thanksgiving for all that you've done and all that you are. It's in the name of your son, Jesus, that we pray these things. Amen. This cup is the blood of the new covenant shed for the forgiveness of sins. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. Please pray with me. God, even as we receive and even as we give thanks for that greatest gift that you've given us, the gift of, of life, new life through your son Jesus, we're also mindful of all the, all the big and small ways that, that you provide for us. We're mindful of the fact that every good and perfect gift comes from above. And, and Lord, we know that sometimes in ways that we don't even acknowledge you, you work in our lives. You, you give us your grace. You give us your kindness and your mercy. And Lord, you, you sustain us in, in so many ways. And God, we're, we're also thankful for the fact that, that you call us to participate in your work. You call upon us to use the gifts 
the talents, the time, the, the resources that you've given us that we might give to, to the work of your kingdom. And so, Lord, we, we pray now that you would take what we have to give, Lord, this, this portion of what you've given us, and, and you would multiply it, you would bless it, you would use it to, to touch people's hearts, you would use it to change people's lives. Most of all, you would use it to bring glory to you, that others might know you, they might know your name, they might know your goodness, uh, and they might worship you. It's in the name of your son, Jesus, that we pray these things. Amen. As the kids head downstairs for Children's Church, we are going to be uh, continuing uh, our reflection on Matthew's Gospel. Today we're going to be in Matthew chapter 11. Let's listen to God's Word together. you the one who is to come, or should we expect someone else? Jesus replied, go back and report to John what you hear and see. The blind receive sight, the lame walk, those who have leprosy are cleansed, the deaf hear, the dead are raised, and the good news is proclaimed to the poor. Blessed is anyone who does not stumble on account of me. As John's disciples were leaving, Jesus began to speak to the crowd about John. What did you go out into the wilderness to see? A reed swayed by the wind? If not, what did you go out to see? A man dressed in fine clothes? No, those who wear fine clothes are in king's palaces. Then what did you go out to see? A prophet? Yes, I tell you, and more than a prophet. This is the one about whom it is written, I will send my messenger ahead of you who will prepare your way before you. Truly, I tell you, among those born of women, there has not risen anyone greater than John the Baptist. Yet whoever is least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he. From the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven has been subjected to violence, and violent people have been raiding it. For all the prophets and the law prophesied until John, and if you're willing to accept it, he is the Elijah who was to come. Whoever has ears to hear, let him hear. To what can I compare this generation? They are like children sitting in the marketplaces and calling out to others. We played the pipe for you, and you did not dance. We sang a dirge, and you did not mourn. For John came neither eating nor drinking, and they say, he has a demon. The son of man came eating and drinking, and they say, here is a glutton and a drunkard, a friend of tax collectors and sinners. But wisdom is proved right by her deeds. Then Jesus began to denounce the towns in which most of his miracles had been performed because they did not repent. Woe to you, Chorazin, woe to you, Bethsaida. For if the miracles that were performed in you had been performed in Tyre and Sidon, they would have repented long ago in sackcloth and ashes. But I tell you, it will be more bearable for Tyre and Sidon on the day of judgment than for you. And you, Capernaum, will you be lifted up to the heavens? No, you will go down to Hades. For if the miracles that were performed in you had been performed in Sodom, it would have remained to this day. But I tell you that it will be more bearable for Sodom on the day of judgment than for you. At that time, Jesus said, I praise you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, because you have hidden these things from the wise and learned and revealed them to little children. Yes, Father, for this is what you were pleased to do. All things have been committed to me by my Father. 
No one knows the Son except the Father, and no one knows the Father except the Son, and those to whom the Son chooses to reveal him. Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. Please pray with me. God, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the ways that your son Jesus reveals to us in his words, in his actions, just in his, in his being, who you are and the ways that you call us into, into your presence, into fellowship with you. God, be with us now as we spend some time reflecting on these, these words from your gospel. Lord, we pray that, that you would give us eyes to see you and ears to hear you and that uh, most of all, Lord, you would give us hearts that are willing to be shaped and, and transformed uh, by the word that you have for us. It's in the name of your son, Jesus, that we pray these things. Amen. There's a story about the, the famous theologian Karl Barth. A couple of us were, were kind of talking about this story a couple weeks ago. And, and up until recently, I had assumed that this story was, was made up or at least mostly fictional, the way a lot of stories about famous people are. Uh, but according to some, some hard-hitting Googling internet research, uh, this story seems to have actually happened. According to the account circulated by countless preachers, devotional writers, and, and bloggers over the past 60 years, when Karl Barth was, was doing a speaking tour of the U.S. in 1962, he was asked after a lecture at the University of Chicago if he could sum up his theology in one sentence. Now, if you know anything about Karl Barth, if you know anything about his influence on the field of theology, the, the study of the Christian faith, you would know that this is a pretty difficult maybe even absurd request. Bart wrote volume after volume of scholarly treatises and discourses on the most erudite matters pertaining to scripture and doctrine. His Church Dogmatics alone, which was his masterwork, spans something like 13 volumes. Each of them are hundreds of pages long. They touch on 2,000 years of Christian thought. So to sum all of that up in a sentence is a pretty audacious thing even to attempt. And yet, according to the story, after a brief pause, Bart said the following. He said, I'll offer a phrase that I learned from a song at my mother's knee. Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. Now, whether that story is true, exactly as it's told, or whether there are so many layers of mythologizing bound up with it that the bare facts become difficult to discern, it's not hard to see why this story has, has been such a popular illustration, why it's been used by preachers from Billy Graham up to the present. At its heart, it expresses a, a central truth that all of us suspect, even if we don't always know how to articulate it. At the heart of our faith, a faith which admittedly can sometimes vex us with its mysteries, sometimes it can overwhelm us with its profundities, is a reality that can be grasped even by a child. And yet it's a reality that has the capacity to change everything about our lives and even beyond that, everything about our world. Jesus loves us and God wants to make this love known to us, whatever it takes. This was a truth that needed to be proclaimed in ways that resonated with people in those early years in the 1960s. When, when Bart allegedly gave his answer at the University of Chicago, uh, a post-war burgeoning of religious devotion was on the wane. It was just a, a few months later that the Organization of American Atheists was founded. It was just a few years later that, that Time magazine would publish its now famous cover that asked the question, is God dead? And while it certainly wasn't the first time in history when long-held religious beliefs were being called into question, it was certainly a highly publicized moment in the history of that idea. And so it stands to reason that for someone like Karl Barth during that moment to give voice to a powerful, simple articulation of faith would have been readily embraced by those who were longing for a sign that God is not in fact dead, but God that is, is alive and well and moving in the hearts of his people. Fast forward to our own generation, which could certainly be classified as an age of skepticism or at least an age of doubt, often profound and angry doubt, directed at the stories of faith that have been handed down to us. 
sometimes this posture of skepticism and doubt has obvious reference. Sometimes it has immediate reasons. Church leaders who have publicly and disastrously ruined their witness. Churches who have lost their way, being bogged down in everything but the gospel of God's grace. Difficult life situations and and world situations that we can't escape due to our endless news cycle. These, These situations which create environments of despair. Things that seem difficult to reconcile with a loving God. We could probably formulate our own lists for why we as a culture wrestle so mightily with faith and doubt. Why people are leaving the church in droves. Why, according to surveys and statistics from numerous organizations, the fastest growing religious group in the West is the nuns, that is, those who refuse to embrace or identify with any sort of religious belief. But before we get completely overwhelmed by the news of the church's demise, or by reports of the collapse of God's kingdom, we should pause. We should take a breath. We should remind ourselves that this is not new. It wasn't new in the 1960s. It isn't new today. As long as humans have been on this earth, as long as humans have grappled with questions of ultimate meaning, humans have doubted. God knows this. God understands it. And God, over and over again throughout history, responds to it. Over the past few months, we've been reading and reflecting on the Gospel of Matthew. This is a a part of the Bible that tells us Jesus loves us, not with abstract theological formulas, but by showing us, by demonstrating in vivid, concrete stories some of the ways that Jesus revealed God's kingdom, some of the ways Jesus revealed God's work among God's children who were hurting, lost, in so many cases hopeless. As we near the the middle chapters of this gospel, after the Sermon on the Mount, after Jesus' initial flurry of miraculous activity, After Jesus has called and sent his earliest disciples throughout the towns and villages of Galilee and Judea, we encounter here in chapter 11 a familiar posture toward the work of Jesus, a sliver of doubt, a moment of wrestling with the powerful truth of what was happening, maybe even a a struggle with disillusionment about God's kingdom and the ways it was unfolding. And it would be easy for us to, to rush to judgment when we see these things in scripture. But to do so would would not only be dishonest, but ultimately counterproductive. We're fooling ourselves if we presume that even after 2,000 years of Christian testimony and Christian witness, even after a lifetime spent with the promises found in the Bible, even after generations of the stories of God's purposes and God's faithfulness being handed down to us, we don't still sometimes struggle with doubt or that we don't still sometimes feel pressed down under the burden of uncertainties. And so rather than just dismiss these things, I'm grateful that the scriptures we've inherited face them head on. I'm grateful that the figures of the past, ancestors in the faith, whether we're talking about Abraham and Jacob or the psalmist or David or even into the New Testament, these people who encountered moments of spiritual struggle are are shown to us. And that we also see in in scripture that God was just as willing to respond to the struggles of his ancient children as he is to respond to us. And so in Matthew chapter 11, over the course of a a few episodes, over the course of a few passages, we see Jesus confronting issues of, of doubt, uncertainty, even unbelief in the people of his time. And it begins in a somewhat unlikely place, maybe a, a surprising place. It begins in a a long-distance conversation between Jesus and John the Baptist. When we last saw John the Baptist in Matthew's gospel, he was bursting onto the scene in the desert of Judea. He was preaching a, a fiery message of repentance about the kingdom of God being at hand. He was heralding the coming of the Messiah. He was baptizing people in the Jordan River to prepare their hearts and their lives so they might be ready to welcome the day of the Lord. But here in Matthew chapter 11, things have changed. Like a lot of prophets, past and present, John has been imprisoned by the authorities. In an attempt to silence John's charges of immorality and injustice against him, Herod has had John thrown into jail. So I can imagine John 
sitting and staring at the four walls of his dank cell, awaiting his fate, assuming correctly, as it will turn out, that he's more likely to die in prison or be executed than to ever see the light of day again. And he's resigned to the fact that he probably won't ever see his disciples or his friends or his family again. That he might never again walk the hills outside of Jerusalem as a free man. And as he sits in that desolate place, he's hearing these stories about Jesus, the one whose coming he had proclaimed, the one that he had pointed to as the Messiah, the promised one of God. And it's not making sense to him. After all, he had done what God had asked him to do. He had declared that the kingdom of God was near. He had declared that the day of the Lord was at hand. He had opened people's eyes to a new reality, a, a new day in which God's purposes were being fulfilled, in which God's enemies were being destroyed. And yet there he sat. He was being held hostage to the whims of a, a depraved and decadent ruler, his hope in something better dwindling by the day. His bold and courageous commitment to God's calling is being put to the test. The declarations he was so sure about have gotten muddled in the darkness of that cell. He's uncertain about where all this is going. He's uncertain about the fact that this kingdom he had proclaimed is, is unfolding in, in ways that he hadn't expected. And so John does what we are sometimes afraid to do in our uncertainty. He doesn't hide from his nagging questions. He asks them. He sends messengers to Jesus himself to find out what he should believe, whether the claims that he had staked his life on are indeed true, whether Jesus really was the promised one that God sent into the world. It's important not to overlook the significance of this on a couple of different fronts, because, because this is a story that speaks volumes to a world, maybe even to a church, that, that so often wrestles with doubt and uncertainty. First, it's important to take note of the fact that the one asking the hard questions here is none other than John the Baptist, the forerunner of Christ, the one whose very life was a fulfillment of God's promises, the one whose calling pointed forward toward what God was yet to do. If John, despite all he knew, despite all he had grown up believing, despite all he had dedicated himself to, if John is allowed this moment of questioning, this moment of thinking, Maybe I was wrong about what God had planned. Maybe I should be expecting someone else. Then it's understandable that we won't always be 100% certain about everything either. It's also important that when John asked Jesus for some assurances, when he made himself vulnerable through, before the Lord by giving, his, by giving voice to his honest but tough questions, Jesus doesn't condemn John. Jesus doesn't attack John for his lack of faith. Instead, he simply points to the fruits of his ministry. He reminds John of the ways that God is at work, the miraculous and powerful revelations of God's glory, the very things that John helped pave the way for. The blind see, the deaf hear, the good news is being preached. Jesus doesn't diminish John's suffering here. He doesn't ignore John's commitment to the mission. In fact, he tells everyone listening how much he thinks of John. He calls John the greatest of those born of women. But that doesn't mean John's calling is easy. It doesn't mean that, that John's place in the world is a comfortable one. Jesus talks about the fact that the, the generation in which he's living is, is a fickle one. The crowds are inconstant. Life is hard. People are filled with all kinds of doubt, and sometimes this doubt is directed at people like John. But God is good. Wisdom is proved right by her deeds. And with this response, Jesus speaks not just to John, but he, he speaks a powerful word to, to anyone who struggles with doubt or with uncertainty, especially when they're facing difficult times. Jesus lets us know that it's okay to ask tough questions. It's okay to confront God with the promises he's made, to ask God why things aren't unfolding the way we expect them to or the way we, we thought they would. It's okay to seek clarity when it comes to matters of God's kingdom. God can take it. God has been listening to these questions from his people since the beginning of time. 
And more often than not, God will respond to us. He'll respond to us in ways that even in our darkness can provide strength. Now, this isn't to say that Jesus doesn't speak some hard words to those who persist in their unbelief. Maybe when when uncertainty about whether God's kingdom is unfolding in the ways we expected turns to certainty that God is not who he says he is, this is when the line is crossed. What, what Jesus is talking about in the middle passage of this chapter is, is not honest doubt, not vulnerable uncertainty, but, but hostile rejection of the ways of God's kingdom. And so Jesus turns from, from honoring John the Baptist to, to condemning the people of Capernaum and Bethsaida and Chorazin, people who had slammed the door on Jesus' mission. When he does this, Jesus isn't speaking to those who would say, like the desperate father later in, Jesus, later in Matthew's gospel, please help my unbelief. He's rather speaking to those who would say, when faced with Jesus' power, Jesus' mercy, the truth of Jesus' kingdom message, I don't need this. I don't want this. I don't have time for this. I'm above this. The cities that, that Jesus speaks so harshly to in this passage, he compares them to the likes of Tyre and Sidon and even of Sodom. They get this treatment because even though they, they had a chance to see firsthand the glory of God, even though they had a chance to feel up close the compassion of Christ, to hear with their own ears the truth of the kingdom from the mouth of the Messiah, they rejected all of it. And they did so not from a posture of honest uncertainty, not from a posture of wounded struggle, but out of stubborn pride. Jesus, Jesus speaks to these towns, Chorazin, Bethsaida, Capernaum. He speaks to them in the same tone that he usually reserves for the Pharisees and chief priests and teachers of the law who called down curses on Jesus because he wasn't who they expected him to be, because no way God could work through someone like that. It's not the tone that Jesus has for the, the woman caught in adultery who struggles to believe that Jesus might actually care about her because the love and kindness he was offering seemed too good to be true. As the chapter closes, Jesus gives voice to an adoring prayer to his father. But then he also extends a, a gentle invitation, maybe to those who are still wrestling with whether to come to him or not, wrestling with whether to, to give themselves over to him or not. He praises God for not merely sharing the good news of the kingdom with the high and mighty, with the wise and the learned, with the self-righteous and the self-assured, but rather to little children, to those who, whether they're in a prison cell or a leper's colony or a prayer closet, are willing to acknowledge their brokenness, willing to confess their sins and shortcomings, willing to own up to their doubts and struggles. Those who realize that the God of Jesus Christ, the God of Israel, has never been a God for those who think they have it all together, who think they have all the answers, but rather for those who know that they don't. Jesus calls all of those who are weary and burdened. And let's face it, we're all weary and burdened. We're all racked with uncertainty at times. We're all overwhelmed by anxiety. We're all weighed down by the crushing sensation that most days we're kind of a mess. To those, Jesus extends this beautiful, blessed invitation to come to him, to take up his yoke, to follow him into the hope that he offers. This won't immediately dispel all of our doubts. It won't answer every question that we have. But it will answer the most important question. It will bring us to a place where we can say, with the trust of a little child, Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. And in those words, when we utter them, when we think them, when we pray them, in those words, we can find life. Please pray with me. God, we come to you confessing that we don't always have all the answers. We don't have the answers for this world. We don't have the answers to our own lives. We often don't have all the answers about you. Lord, like like John the Baptist, we struggle with how things are going. We struggle with whether we are living according to your calling. We struggle to, to know who you've set us apart to be. But God, we, we pray that, that even in that 
vulnerable position, Lord, even in those, in those moments when we, we know we don't have all the answers, we know we don't have it all together, we would do what John did. We would come to you. We would seek you. We would look to you for, for, the, for the answers that we seek. God, we pray that, that we wouldn't steel ourselves against your kingdom. We wouldn't assume that because of the, the, the things we face or because of the, the, the things we wrestle with, that, uh, that we're certain that, that your kingdom is not where the answer is found. But God, we pray that in humility, like little children, we would continue to call on you, knowing that where there's darkness, you provide light, knowing that where there are questions, you are the answer, and knowing that where we struggle, you provide the, the, the guidance and the strength that we need. God, in those moments, help us to be honest with ourselves, help us to be honest with, with who we are, and help us to, to rely on you and who you say you are. Lord, help us to, to trust in you in your love, in your mercy, in your grace. And in trusting, help us to, to find the strength and the life that we need. It's in the name of your son, Jesus, that we pray these things. Amen. We set aside time each week to respond to the good news. Um, Jesus told John when he was asking, you know, is this, are, are, are you the one we were, we were to expect? Should we wait for someone else? One of the things Jesus said is the good news is preached. The, the message that God's kingdom is at hand is is made known to the poor, is made known to those who are struggling, is made known to those who are burdened. And when that message is proclaimed, when we encounter Jesus in the scriptures, we're always given the choice whether to receive him, whether to embrace him, or to do what the, the, the people in Chorazin and Bethsaida and, and Capernaum apparently did, to, to reject him, to keep him at arm's length, to, to say that we don't need him. And so we set aside time each week if God's moving in you, if God's working on your heart to, to respond to that, to, to confess Christ, to be baptized into him, to begin walking in the ways that, that he, he lays out for us. It's also time for those of you who have made that decision. If you want to join us here at, at First Christian as we seek to do that together, as we seek to walk in, in his ways, as we seek to follow his path, as we stumble and <laughs> need encouragement and need to be lifted up and need to be prayed for, um, on a daily basis. Um, if you want to join us here at First Christian as we seek to do that, we, we invite you to do that as well. And then finally, it's just a time for those of you who need prayer. We'd love to, to pray for you. And if any of this is tough to do in front of a group of people, please talk to somebody before you leave today. Let us pray with you. Let us pray for you. Let us see what God's doing in your life. Now, as the worship team sings, let's stand and join them. If you have a decision to make, please come forward.
may be seated. Once again, it's it's been a joy to get to worship with you all this morning, both those of you here in the sanctuary and also those of you worshiping at home. Um, in a moment, I'm going to close in prayer, but, but before we do that, just a few announcements. First of all, um, after service today, there is a, an education committee meeting over in the fellowship hall. Um, I think there's soup provided as well, so if, uh, you can you can grab lunch over there. If you're part of the education committee, make sure you, uh, you, you join us for that. Um, Coming up on Wednesday night, uh, we'll be having our regularly scheduled Wednesday activities, so 545 uh, meal in the fellowship hall, um, followed by, um, at 645, um, uh, kids ministry over in the fellowship hall, and youth group and adult uh, Wednesday night conversations over here in the church building. So that's uh, just a great opportunity in the middle of the week to come together, to pray, to, uh, to, to fellowship together, and, and just to, to, to grow together. Um, so that's Wednesday night, starting at 5:45 for the meal and 6:45 for the um, for the for the groups, the youth and, and kids and adult ministries. Um, are there any other announcements this morning? Yeah. Okay. Sa- Saturday morning, right? So uh, men's breakfast uh, Saturday at Unicoi Christian Church at 8 a.m. So everyone's invited. So hope you can uh, join us for that, Lou. Okay. Okay. Memorial Day service at Veterans Park up here, uh, up Main Street at 2 o'clock this afternoon. Thank you, Lou. Other announcements? Yeah. Okay. Okay. <laughs> okay. So... So yeah, so our Wednesday night meal, as opposed to, we're going to do this a lot in the summer, um, as opposed to one person preparing all the food, um, it is a potluck. So if you're planning on joining us for Wednesday night meal, uh, bring some food to share. Um, Anything else? All right, let's close in prayer. God, we thank you so much for this beautiful morning you've given us. We thank you for the chance to, to gather here, Lord, to gather around your word, to gather around your table, to gather... Um, and, and, and to lift up our hearts and our voices to you. And we thank you, God, that even as you gather us, you also send us out. And so we pray that as we go out into this world this week, Lord, you would send us out as, as ministers of your kingdom, as missionaries, as, as those bearing your name and your glory um, in the, the big things and the small things we do. Uh, we pray, God, that, that we would go out as those who, who testify to, to who you are and who you've called us to be. And Lord, that others might, might see and hear and, and know that you are a good God. It's in the name of your son, Jesus, and by the power of your Holy Spirit that we pray these things. Amen. Go in peace.